Tim. Welcome to Watchbox. We are waking up with watches this weekend. As ever, everything you see here on the table is for sale. Names, references, and where available prices are in the description below. And some of these watches are not on our website. You're going to want to email me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com, if you have questions about those or prices, accessories, condition, extra photos regarding any of the watches you see here, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Okay, let's get started with a watch that frankly is just beyond belief because it's so artistically dense that it almost overwhelms the senses. Launched back in 2016, this is the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Open Worked. Now the timepiece, which perhaps properly would be described as open wrought, is known as the reference 15407, 41 millimeters in rose gold. The caliber uses a 3134 profile, which includes full freehand skeletonization of the components. Caliber 3134 is an evolved double balance, as this is the open worked double balance, properly speaking. It has an upper bridge with a free sprung balance, and then on the opposite side, when you reverse the watch, and by the way, it is an automatic caliber, there is another free sprung balance. Let me see if I can show it to effect here. There we go. There is another free sprung balance, and the hairspring is 180 degrees reversed on that other balance. Why? Two reasons. First, the balances sit on a similar fully aligned axis, and they are on one staff, so they oscillate together as one mass. By increasing the mass, doubling the mass, the watch is made more resistant to bump, concussion, and vibration-induced timing deviation. By moving the hairsprings 180 degrees out of alignment, you create an off-centered mass on both sides, such that each one cancels the other. When one is up in a position to run faster with respect to gravity, the other one will run more slowly, canceling out the deviation caused by position and gravity. Throw the watch on the wrist, it is a robust piece. Fully loomed, automatic winding with a screw down crown and 50 meters water resistant. I have to say that the watch is actually fairly easy to read in person as the nickel anthracite coating over the movement itself allows the rose gold hands to pop quite easily. It's simple to see easy to read, handsome to behold, and beguiling on both sides. This is a watch that is still hand finished externally, bracelet, bezel, and case. Approximately 11 to 9 hours as ever to hand finish the metal components, but it's the interior of this one. Whereas something like a caliber 3120 is, ha is basically hand assembled, but mechanically finished, this is hand assembled and hand finished. It is a much higher level of Audemars Piguet execution with innumerable interior angles and every edge broad, beautiful, polished, and gleaming. There is no machine engalage in this watch. Now for some, a Royal Oak budget isn't in the cards, and for those, there are options. 40 millimeters in stainless steel and launched in 2019, this is the Bell & Ross BR05. Clearly, it owes a huge debt of gratitude to Gerald Genta on several levels. But this model with the black dial is one of three released. There's a blue and there's a gray, and the black dial is the most closely linked to Bell & Ross's prior design identity, specifically the instrument series. So the watch is very much Bell & Ross across its dial, and I would say a combination of Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe across its bezel and case. Now the case and the bracelet are made by GNF Chatelain of Le Loque, which is one of the best case bracelet and clasp makers in the business. And I have to say that the assembly quality as well as the execution of the beveling and the satin finish, though machine executed, is razor sharp, beautiful, and exacting. Which is to say that this watch, which costs perhaps a tenth of even a basic Nautilus 5711 at this point, represents an outstanding functional substitute at 40 millimeters in diameter and 100 meters water resistance. You'll look on the back and you can see there is a iteration on the ETA 2892, which is a thin, fine, automatic winding, stop second, quick set date movement. You can see there's a lovely skeletonized winding mass. You'll also appreciate that no corners were cut in the construction of the bracelet. As you can see, despite the price point, all of the removable links are fixed by screws, and the watch includes half links for precise sizing. So no pin sleeves here, Patek Philippe. 
This one is actually built without compromise about its bracelet assembly. I also have to say that the fit on the wrist is flat, flush, and comfortable, as this one's narrower across the wrist than a Royal Oak 41 by far. The bracelet pulls down quite easily, and there's no virtual flare to add artificial diameter or span. I should also say that the tolerances between the links are outstanding. They're flush, they're flat, and it's not until you get to the underside where you see a calculated gapping of the links that's designed to avoid pinching skin, pulling hair, or trapping wrist heat. This is a really impressive execution from Bell & Ross. Simple, stylish, obviously an homage watch to other brands, but still functional, fun, and honest. That said, if you have perhaps 20 times the budget and you want the original integrated bracelet sports watch, there is always a Royal Oak or a Nautilus, in this case, the 57 27, or excuse me, 5726 annual calendar. The 5726 annual calendar, as you see right here, debuted back in 2012 with the silver dial. It's silver opaline white with the lateral strakes and blackened white gold hands and indices, which make this one far easier to read than the standard gray dial model, or for that matter, the successor with the blue dial. The watch is 40.5 millimeters, and I have to say it wears fairly easily, though compared to a 5711, it feels almost like a Royal Oak offshore compared to a standard Royal Oak jumbo. On the wrist, it's burly. It's substantial. It's got an imposing stance and it looks more like a 42 or a 43. The timepiece is still 120 meters water resistant in spite of the through case fittings for the annual calendar. And I should mention that this is sort of an ultimate Patek Philippe as it combines two features intricately and intimately entwined with the brand's legacy. Of course, in 1976, Gerald Genta, following up his own Royal Oak four years later, designed the Nautilus for Patek Philippe. And in 1996, exactly 20 years later, Patek Tech Philippe launched the annual calendar, the first ever complication in that class. The annual calendar need be corrected only once a year during the jump from February to March. When you turn it over, you can see it's a handsome and contemporary caliber 324 base. Six position adjusted, free sprung, gyro max balance, silicon hairspring, all of that refinement, giving you a watch that includes not only the annual calendar complication, but the ability to run to no worse than minus three plus two seconds a day. It is handsomely hand finished. You can see the linear Cote de Genève across the bridges, circular Cote de Genève on the rotor. There's a macro perlage or engine turning on the base plate, and my favorite detail, a mini spiral perlage on the center of the rotor. Though you can't see it, the screw heads are black polished with chamfered slots and circumference, and the edge of every bridge is mirror beveled. A truly special watch. Remember, fully loomed, automatic, all steel, full bracelet, and 120 meters. This is a real sports watch. That said, it's not my favorite stainless steel Patek Philippe. We're getting closer to that one. This is a model that was launched Back in 2014, and it represented a little bit of a break with the past of the 5960 model, which had launched in 2006 as a dress watch complication. Well, the 5961A was a sports watch. Full stainless steel, 40.5 millimeters, larger hands, more loom, and a full integrated bracelet with a five link design. The individual small links with big gaps between vent the wrist beautifully. And if you are going to wear your watch on a hot day during activities when you're going to sweat in weather, you're going to want a full bracelet is you're going to save yourself that three to four hundred dollar strap investment every two years or so. It also gives the watch an all of a piece sporting demeanor as the bracelet is identified with the sports watch. So too is the complication, a chronograph, the king of complications. And this one is a flyback chronograph that you can reset and restart without stopping by pushing the trigger down at four o'clock. Note there's a mono counter down at the bottom with hours and minutes on one scale superimposed to maintain the the symmetry and avoid crowding of the dial. There's also a small blue dot at the bottom that lets you know it is the night time. It is the time when you will not use the adjusters to adjust the annual calendar. And that's another important point. This is another annual calendar. Adjustment once a year, otherwise it can deal with the irregular length months, whereas a standard complete calendar needs to be adjusted five times a year. We have blackened indices and hands, again, in white gold. And if you look very carefully, there is a power reserve indicator up at 12 o'clock on the dial. 
The watch has an up to 55 hour automatic winding power reserve and the flyback chronograph is a caliber CH28520. Let me try to flip it so you can see the balance there. This is a movement that features a vertical clutch and a column wheel. The vertical clutch for smooth engagement and if you choose continuous hazard free running of the chronograph and the column wheel for crisp actuation. Now again you've got the silicon hairspring and the free sprung gyro max style balance and in general more impressive finishing than on the 320 because with the levers and mechanism of the chronograph, there's more to see and it's more elaborately and intricately finished. Throw the watch on the wrist, very comfortable. It's fairly broad, but you can see the lugs curve down and around the wrist, and the watch sits relatively flush and under 14 millimeters thick with a sloped flank, it does slide underneath the cuff. I find that of the two versions available, the silver model is perhaps the more formal of the two and offering the higher contrast at a glance. That said, the one year only 2017 launch 010, the 5960 1A010 is my favorite. Of the two, give me this one. Of all the stainless steel Patek Philippe's, give me this one. Still 40.5 millimeters, but now with a matte black dial and polished white gold indices and hands, this is a spectacular sports watch. Though not an aquatic sports watch at 30 meters, it has every other feature you just saw on its silver dial brother, but the fact that it was launched in 2017 and discontinued continued after about eight months of production means this is a complicated full bracelet stainless steel Patek Philippe one year model with a black dial. Does it get any better than that? Well, no. As far as steel Patek's concerned, that's the one I'd want. Are there more valuable examples? Sure. Are there more complicated examples? Maybe it only watch, but if I were to buy myself a steel Patek, it would be that full stop, no second guessing. All right, let's talk a little bit about high horology and a watch that's making a second appearance this week because frankly, it's a goddamn green tourbillon and I cannot get over it. This is my favorite F.P. Journe, known as the Jade Tourbillon. Technically, it is the Tourbillon Souverain 40 millimeters in platinum. And as you can see, it features a glorious green jade dial, hand cut, a thin sliver of jade bifurcated to create the upper and lower portions of the dial. F.P. Journe makes the case, the movement, and the dial. And I was told when I saw this under construction in his factory in 2017 that he doesn't like to talk about or promote the model Presumably, as I gather, because it's hard to make the dial and it slows down other production. So, this is a watch that F.P. Journe hates. And frankly, F.P. Journe can be a love-hate kind of guy. If you love him, this is your watch. If you hate him, this is your watch. It's a perfect F.P. Journe. Rose gold movement as ever, beautifully blazing in 18 karat bridges and plates with a constant force, one second jumping remontoire de galette that also powers the deadbeat seconds on the dial side. We'll get a little bit closer and we'll take a look at both that jade dial and the tourbillon regulator, which is beautiful, brilliant, blazing in black polish for both the half bridge as well as the carriage. Six position adjustment, free sprung with a rare for FP Journe overcoil hairspring. So you have the remontoire, the tourbillon, six position adjustment, free sprung with the overcoil, ensuring that this is a rare wristwatch tourbillon that also subscribes to the tenets of proper chronometry. Throw it on the wrist. It's a 40 millimeter platinum Souverain case, which means it's thin at under 10 millimeters and it's 48 millimeters lug to lug with tightly curved lugs. So I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeter circumference. And of course, it also has the power reserve indicator for the 42 hour manual wind reserve de Marche. Gold inside and platinum on the outside. This is a heavy and impressive watch. Now, speaking of impressive watches, I think it is important we recognize that not all Blancpain are dive watches. The Blancpain brand, which makes at this point probably only about 10,000 to 15,000 pieces a year, is based out of Les Brassus in the Vallée du Jeu, not far from the likes of Audemars Piguet and Gégère Lecoult. And as you can see, this watch right here represents the high horology tradition of the region. A timepiece that's only about 37 millimeters, about 37.5 in rose gold. This is an eight day automatic flying tourbillon. It has an eight day power reserve indicator. It has a flying tourbillon. It has a date indication and it has an eight day automatic winding power reserve with 100 meter water resistance. Does this watch do it all? Just about. 
even better. The tourbillon on this watch was designed for Blancpain during the 90s by Vincent Calabrese, co-founder of the AHCI and one of the true greats of independent watchmaking. So you're getting a mainstream group brand, Blancpain, Swatch Group backing it with Swatch Group money that will be around forever to service this watch, but you're getting independent horology cool and the legacy of Vincent Calabrese, who among many others created the Coram Golden Bridge and is regarded as one of the modern master and pioneers of independent high horology in the modern age. This is like getting an independent brand watch with high horology features and extravagant finish, but with the backing of a major group to ensure it can always be serviced and parts will always be available. Note the free hand skeletonized and engraved rotor for this caliber 25 with its eight day power reserve. Note the underside of the movement with all engine turning on its bridges and plates mirrored on glage with black polished screws finely hand finished on both sides. What I appreciate about the tourbillon is not just that it has no upper pivot, which is what makes it a flying tourbillon, so you can see it in its entirety, but the actual carriage itself, and you can really see it here, is black polished to a mirror shine. As good as it gets in rose gold, this watch has a discreet wrist presence. I've always felt that colored gold watches should be a little bit smaller than white metal watches as they become overpowering and garish when they're over 40 millimeters or God help us when they're 42 millimeters or larger. This watch is perfect. A dress watch in size and proportion, a high horology watch in finish and refinement, and even an independent horology watch in patrimony and ancestry, a really special piece. Now we're gonna to return to Blancpain in just a moment, but we're gonna finish talking about co-AHCI member F.P. Journe. The AHCI is like the cool kids club of independent watchmakers. In exchange for offering their support to the academy, the academy offers them grants, financial support, and promotion. And F.P. Journe, back in 2015, launched what he considered to be his perfection of the perpetual calendar, the AHCI Laureate offering a timepiece based on his five-day power reserve Octa movement that allows you to adjust all of the functions through the crown and a hidden adjuster, if I can pull it out with my minimal nails, I'm gonna demonstrate that there is a hidden adjuster underneath the lug up at one o'clock. You can see it sticking out. It is an adjuster for the month. And you can see how I am adjusting the month by pulling the little dog leg lever. And then just as easily as I popped it out, I hide it and it's unseen. The reason was twofold. First, F.P. Journe didn't want to look at pusher adjuster dimples on the flank of his case. Second, he reasoned that you wouldn't have to use a tool to make the adjustment. And finally, since you wouldn't have to use a tool, you were less likely to lose the tool and try to make the adjustment with the tip of a pen and damage the watch. Now the watch is 40 millimeters in platinum and this example is what's known as the black label. Perpetual calendar, five day power reserve, truth be told, it'll run for seven. And then you have the black dial with the platinum case that is exclusive to F.P. Journe, boutique and espace with strict limits on the number two of any given model that can be made in a year. Very special, very exclusive, not just exclusive to those boutique retailers, but you must have previously purchased an F.P. Journe timepiece through authorized channels to get this watch. A very special piece, and as you can see, 18 karat rose gold on the reverse side. It's a special watch, immensely heavy thanks to the platinum case and the gold movement. Like I said, it's a five day chronometric power reserve, but it will run for seven. It's adjusted in five positions like a chronometer with a free sprung balance beaten away at 21.6. You can see barley corn finish on the rotor, circular Cote de Genève on the bridges, engine turned perlage on the base plate, mirrored on glage on the edge of the bridges, and these are black polished rather than blued screws. Throw it on the wrist, it's got a lot of pressure. You just saw the 40 millimeter tourbillon souverain, and that's exactly what this is right here. A 40 millimeter watch that sits broad across the wrist, but not so broad that I wouldn't recommend it for a 13 and a half centimeter forearm. It's thicker than a typical FP Journe, but still thin enough to fit underneath any cuff, and you do get a sense of the quality. It's also a handsome two-tone of black and silver. I'm not one for rose gold, yellow gold, or steel in combination, but give me a black and white two-tone color scheme. I am all over that. That is a great looking watch. That said, we can get more exclusive. And in order to do so, we reach back to 2014, celebrating the anniversary, 1964 to 2014, of France's diplomatic relations with China. 
completed by Charles de Gaulle and Mao Zedong in 1964, it was the first establishment of diplomatic relations between a major Western nation and China at the time. Now, the watch you see here, of course, is designed by F.P. Journe, who is French, not Swiss. And so this is part of his national heritage. The watch was crafted to be subtle. If you look very carefully, you can see that it actually says France Xin 50, and then in Chinese characters, it doubles the message. And that's what that little red square is. I should also mention that the dial is a lovely blue, not quite navy. It's brighter than that. It's a matte blue with applique white gold Arabic numerals rather than the Convented, conventional printed numerals, and all of the physical printing on the dial that is not applique is off-white, a little bit like you see on the chronomet bleu. So this is an octa-automatic, again with the five-day power reserve, chronometric, seven-day power reserve, absolute. It features a moon phase, a double-digit date with blue printing on silver. This is the France-China 50th anniversary piece, and you can see that the timepiece again with the caliber 1300 in rose gold, has a very special look to it that's subtle. I have to say you almost have to loop the logo on the dial to read what it actually says. So don't worry about the peripheral branding here. You can really see, by the way, the white gold numerals lighting up on the dial at this angle. It's a special looking piece that matches particularly well to my cuff. Any kind of dark colored sleeve, this is going to look absolutely bomber. And with the combination of the 40 millimeter white metal case and the medium blue dial, it's a striking and different look for FP Journe. So if you like the Journe watches, but you don't like the fact that a lot of them do look very similar, get this one because it's a standout even amongst the rarefied 600 to 900 piece a year Journe production. And that is all F.P. Journe makes per year. That said, we can do better. If you want a 38-piece limited edition made for one year only in stainless steel, recall the five pieces built in 2015 to say goodbye to the original 38mm F.P. Journe case size. This might have been the most charismatic. The original balanced resonance one dial with a few refinements. First, the case, yes, it's the discontinued 38, but it's in stainless steel. Second, yes, this is the resonance one and resonance two dial, much loved, but look closely, the butts keep coming. And you could see that all of the printing on the dial is in navy blue, not the usual black. A very special watch with a movement to match. You could see, and I'm going to turn it upside down here, caliber 1499 in 18 karat rose gold is all about the two beating balances. The watch is a true dual time, and you can set the two different time zones two different times, or you can sync them up. There's a power reserve for the 40 to 42 hour manual wine reserve demarche, but it is two movements split down the center in one case. The balances are designed to resonate, which is to say, by means of their proximity and artisanal tuning, they will synchronize to each other after about seven to 10 minutes. Meaning if one, because of position or shock, runs fast or slow, the other will regulate it, slow it down or speed it up as necessary. And there are two barrels under the barrel bridge, two separate drivetrains, two separate Swiss lever escapements. This watch against the ear sounds like absolutely nothing else in watchmaking. You can see there's a small black polished rack and pinion assembly that you can use if you are the FP Journe watchmaker to vary the distance between the two balances and escapements. And it uses the same resonance principle established by clockmaker Antti Janvier with pendulum clocks and metronomes. You can do the same thing with escapements and balances if you are FP Journe. Now, of course, because it takes seven to 10 minutes for the two balances to synchronize, even if you have the dials set to the same time, the seconds hands will not be synchronized. So there's a flyback mechanism like a flyback chronograph that you pull down at four o'clock to synchronize them. And now everything is simpatico. Throw it on the wrist. I should mention this watch has one more refinement you won't typically find on a Journe. Not just a deployment clasp, which is an optional feature on a Journe watch, but a full steel deployment clasp at that to match the case. On the wrist, it's impressive. It doesn't need size to make a statement. This is a watch for a connoisseur, a traditionalist, a guy who has every Journe watch and perhaps needs one of the five to complete his set. Again, only 38 examples of each of the steel 38 send-off models were made in 2015 to collect the set 
along with, for example, collecting the three Vagabondage or the five Ruthenium watches, considered to be one of the great achievements in F.P. Journe connoisseurship. Few will realize that dream, but to own just one is more than enough satisfaction for most, yours, in, yours truly included, as I happen to love the resonance because it's an absolutely unique concept, never done in a wristwatch before F.P. Journe. He can absolutely claim that this was a world premiere, derivative of nothing except clocks. Now, let's say you want a blanc pain dive watch, but you think the standard 5015 is just too large. Well, for those, there is the bathyscaph, and the bathyscaph, I should mention, 43 millimeters is also a stripped down 50 fathoms. Mechanically identical to the 5015, the reference 5000 features a no guard big crown profile designed to evoke the 1950s. It features a minimally beveled squared off lug profile and a thin mid case. This is very different from the bright polish separate structural lugs of the 5015, which has those sharp breaks where the lugs emerge from the case and polished flanks. It's also thinner. The timepiece, still 300 meters water resistant, features a gray sunburst dial, and as you can see, it features instead of the sapphire capped bezel of the 5015, a ceramic capped bezel in steel. Let's throw it up against the mic and have a listen to the ratchet action. It's sharp. It's crisp, it's precise, 120 clicks, so you're gonna be able to pr place it precisely. Caliber 1315, six position adjustment, not the hierology standard of five. It's free sprung, three barrels, five day power reserve, automatic winding, stop seconds, quick set date, and because of the free sprung architecture, it's shock resistant. Because it's fairly thick, it's not as susceptible to shocks as a thin movement would be. And because it has a silicon hairspring, it's anti-magnetic. It's also handsomely finished. As you can see, there's an unusual brushed satin finish across the bridges rather than the conventional coat de Genève and I was impressed by the fact that the anglage here, and you can really see it lighting up as I turn it oblique to the camera, but the anglage here is among the best in the business. Fat, broad, and visible without a loop. You can see the mirrored beveling. It's not, it's not hairline thin the way some brands render it. Here, it's broad enough to appreciate without optics. You'll also appreciate that all the screw heads are black polished and that satin across the bridges is quite beautiful and unique. Throw it on the wrist, easy to wear, sailcloth strap with rubber on the underside so it's very supple on the wrist. Because it is narrow across the wrist, I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. It's a timepiece of exceptional quality impressive presence and unrivaled finish inside and out. Remember, same movement as the standard 50 fathoms and the same 300 meter diving depth. We're going to come back to our divers in just a moment. I want to talk about a watch that featured on the program earlier in the week, but because it's a chiming watch and I didn't allow it to sound off, I feel almost as though I've cheated you. So we're back with the Alanco Unzona Zeitwerk Striking Time, a 44.2 millimeter white gold digital jumping time display with power reserve that strikes on the quarters and the hours. Launched in 2011, let's watch the jump and then hear the chime. All right, now let's hear the chime up against my mic. The chime does vary a little bit, depending on whether it's a quarter or an hour being sounded. Now the timepiece has an incredible variation on the caliber L043. As you can see, German silver bridges and plates. It's the nickel, copper, zinc alloy, with the copper giving it that golden hue. As you can see, there's a black polished Maltese cross on top of the barrel to stop the mechanism when it no longer has the energy to jump the minutes. It has a constant force device that transfers by a separate locking lever with Paul jewels to a double third wheel with a hairspring in between. That's the Ramontois de Galate constant force device. And every minute, a burst of energy is transmitted to that hairspring. And that's what powers the balance, the tension in that hairspring. The barrel never directly drives the balance because if it did, the energy of this immense spring would overdrive the escapement and break it. The power needed to keep jumping these mechanisms for 36 hours of power reserve, simply too much for the Swiss lever to accomplish 
accommodate. So you have that constant force device to maintain constant amplitude and excellent timekeeping, but also to protect the escapement. Now, one side of the mainspring is actually anchored to the movement. It's not entirely contained in the barrel. So powerful is that spring that one half of it is anchored to the movement plate itself. This is an extraordinary hand-finished watch with freehand engraving, mirrored on glage, glasuta stripes, handsome satination on all of the wheels and the train with black polish abundant and featuring both black polished screws and fired blue. Throw it on the wrist real quick, a very special piece. It's got more wrist presence than a standard 42 millimeter Zeitwerk and that's no bad thing. If you've got the larger wrist, this is going to be the one for you. I know a football player who's about 6'5", 320 pounds who wears this exact watch, it looks butch on his wrist. If you've got that kind of tree trunk forearm, this is going to be the Zeitwerk for you. And quite possibly the Longa of choice. Now, we talked about Patek watches in stainless steel, but let's talk about Patek in a precious metal. I'm not into rose gold or yellow gold. And I think when you start getting large, you're closing in on 40 millimeters, white metals play better. And that's certainly the case with the 2017 release, Patek Philippe Calatrava 6006G. It is in the tradition of 1993's micro rotor off center seconds, caliber 5000. That became a larger 37 millimeter watch in 2005. It gained a new dial in 2008 and the 37 millimeter watch became the 6006 with a 39 millimeter case in 2017. And the watch that you see right here is the successor to that 37 millimeter 6000, but it maintains the best features, including the wonderful piano key style center hours and minutes track, the outboard radial indication of the date and the off-centered seconds. The lug profile is strong, almost like a sports watch. You could see this is anything but a typically meek Calatrava integrated lug set as they're strong, narrow, angular, and squared off in a way that a typical Calatrava would not be. This is less the legacy of the reference 96 of 1932 than it is the reference 5000 of 1993. And when you turn it all over, you get the latest version of the Caliber 240 micro rotor, which does three things. One, it gives you the convenience of automatic winding. Two, it gives you the open display case back vista of a manual wind. And three, it gives you the thin case profile of a manual wind watch. Very special. A watch that wears beautifully on the wrist, comfortably, and yet with a strong presence due to the lugs. This watch has often been described as an automotive-inspired timepiece in all but name. It's often cross-compared to the gauges of vintage 1950s Jaguars, Mercedes-Benz, and Porsche sports cars, and I don't disagree with any of the comparisons. Often described as the Patek Roadster unofficially, it is a timepiece that people love or hate. I'm not going to varnish it. If you love the automotive associations, if you love the unusual display of date, the off-center seconds, and the unconventional use of a micro-rotor automatic in a Calatrava, this watch is for you. Full deployment clasp and matching white gold it has a very special wrist presence that's broad and stern and yes I use that in jest that term a little bit of a double entendre as you can see this rather stern profile also has a broad stance so though it's not huge across the wrist it has outsized personality it has a strong machine ethic about it though nothing like this next watch in the world of machine ethics this is the watch that sets the mark this timepiece looks like a Terminator from the future. This is the last thing John Connor will ever see. The timepiece, launched in 2018, was a wonderful take on the H1 that launched back in 2011 for HYT, a hydromechanical time display. This is the H0 that takes the same caliber 101 developed in conjunction with Chronode and HYT's subsidiary, Pressiflex. It uses two immiscible liquids. One is blue, one is clear, and they fit inside these little bellows, which, as you can see through the case back, are actually quite voluminous and driven by cams that will pump the liquid in either direction. It has a 65-hour manual wind power reserve inside this lugless 48 point eight millimeter steel case and those cams pump the liquid back and forth. If you think about it, this watch is a regulator as you have separate displays of minutes 
hours and seconds, there's a power reserve indicator that's shaded. It turns dark blue as you wind it up. And let me demonstrate what happens. It is also a retrograde such that when you reach the end of its six hour span, it jumps straight back. And that's exactly what it's doing right now. It is jumping all the way back to its point of origin. Now the watch is very simple to operate. You take the crown, you turn it, and you start advancing the time. As you advance the time, remember there are two liquids, one is clear, one is blue. As you advance the time, you start to see the blue liquid displace the clear liquid. One side of the bellows pushes the blue as the other side receives the incoming volume of the clear. There is a sapphire tube inside that bears the fluid and that is actually shaped using technology originally developed for NASA to form high-tech sapphire and glass micro componentry. This is an impressive watch. As it is lugless, it also wears easily on a small wrist. The strap is a wonderful silicone that means it's absolutely gummy like a swatch and comfortable on the wrist because it has a large domed crystal. It's an easy watch to wear without ever scratching, scuffing, or otherwise marking it. The steel case itself is only a small sliver of the total thickness. It's like a big sapphire birthday cake, a present every day on your wrist. And one feature I happen to like is the fact that the watch is a slick silver and blue two-tone, unlike anything else in shape, in function, or color scheme. This is a really special watch. It also includes a full deployant clasp, as you can see, a rather substantial deployant clasp, and a case back that allows to appreciate in full the highly mechanized traditional movement underneath the immiscible fluids and the hydraulic display of time on the dial side. A truly special watch. This is the HYT H0 with lugless case profile. Okay, now we're getting into the final rounds here. For a lot of folks, a dive watch should be 40 millimeters or smaller, that's traditional. And it doesn't hurt if the watch incorporates traditional styling cues. And back in 2017, that is exactly what Bramont gave the world with its Supermarine S301. Now the S301 recalls the best of principally Blancpain, Rolex, and Tudor dive watches during the 1950s, as it is a big crown no guard profile with a simple ecru style Fotina dial and matching numerals and indices inside a ceramic insert diving bezel. The watch is 40 millimeters and includes a three-part case construction that features both hardened DLC diamond-like carbon and steel that has been specially treated to achieve almost 2,000 vickers of surface hardness. Now, the strap is a lovely contrasting stitch bonded calf skin and you can see it is a substantial piece thick cut. The watch features the image of a supermarine record-setting flying, well, it's not a flying boat, it's a seaplane. A flying boat would have its own hull and it would sit on the hull. This was a record-breaking seaplane during the 1930s built by Supermarine, whose name implies that it was originally a creator of seaplanes prior to developing the famous elliptical wing Merlin-powered Spitfire fighter that helped to fight the Battle of Britain in World War II. But you can see many of the early design elements in the record-setting speed contestant seaplanes built for record setting by Supermarine during the 1930s. Inside, it's a basic chronometer certified Salida movement and it's water resistant down to an impressive 300 meters. Throw it on the wrist and it's short across the wrist. A lovely vintage look and again, no corners cut. The movement is chronometer certified. The case is face hardened steel. The timepiece features a ceramic bezel insert, not anodized aluminum, and the quality of the leather is superlative. This watch is made in London and adjusted in the UK. So it's substantially British watchmaking, something of which you see relatively little. But my favorite feature on the watch is actually the hybrid broadsword syringe hands used for the hour as well as the minute. They are both broadsword and syringe with a segmented cathedral style form as well. So they are cathedral, syringe, and broadsword hands all in one with a lovely red submariner evocative text across the dial base. Though there is one weird quirk on the watch. We all understand that 300 meters is not the 1,000 feet that it's normally equated to on the dial of most watches. But what's odd is that 300 meters also isn't 980 feet. It's a little over 984 feet. So better, but not yet perfect. If you want perfect, 
you want this. Probably the best Blancpain watch since the 5015 in 2007, this is the Barracuda. The 50 Fathoms Barracuda, 40.3 millimeters in stainless steel, 500 pieces, only 13.23 millimeters thick. This is a watch that is an homage to a model built for German combatant forces as well as civilians and distributed by the Barracuda firm within Germany during the 1960s. You can see it has a simple matte dial, a ecru fotina look that actually works well in the context of the white varnished hands and the red accents outboard. The timepiece features all of the luxuries inherent in the 50 Fathoms 5015, including the lovely cambered sapphire cap over the bezel. The bezel is fully loomed. The detent action is excellent. both crisp and refined, a 120 click timing bezel, and again, fully loomed bezel, lots of loom at night, a lovely vintage inspired aesthetic by day, and on the case back, you get the 100 hour power reserve, twin mainspring barrel, caliber 1151. As with the 1315 in the bathys gap, this one is hand finished to a high degree, free sprung, six position adjusted with a silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism, all of this 300 meters water resistant and very special, with a rubber tropic style strap that itself evokes history. This is a great diver for those who feel that a traditional 5015 at 45 millimeters is too much, and even think that the 43 for the bathyscaphe is pushing it. This is a perfect diver, gorgeous and deserving as our cap watch, our capstone, our final watch, the ultimate of this episode, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Barracuda, possibly the coolest new dive watch of the last calendar year, and a 500 piece stainless steel 40 millimeter limited edition. That is a wrap with the exception of two that I almost forgot. Taking a quick reverse, let's not forget Rolex. I was being a little bit unkind as I was trying to leave these guys near the end, but not absolutely at the end. And we really should talk about two lovely black bezel 40 millimeter beauties. We've got the Rolex GMT, discontinued a year ago with the black bezel and the 31 86 movement. This is a watch that features the lovely green GMT hand and green GMT script. Ceramic bezel insert, bi-directional 24 hour with platinum deposits that create the indices and the numerals. So you have a bezel that is a steel base, a cerachrom insert all in black, no two-tone, no double color. And of course, you've got the platinum deposits for the numerals. The dial with white gold hands, as well as a black glossy lacquer base and in a case that's 100 meters water resistant, you do get a chronometer certification and you do get 100 meter water resistance. So while this is generally regarded as an aviator's timepiece, this is also the subdued discrete version of the GMT Master II. The all black bezel no longer available is a bit of a collector's piece. If you want a watch that has that classical steel and black Rolex rotating bezel look, but you don't want another Submariner, this is a great way to go. A truly special piece and again, a bit of a cult watch as it's it's not a Pepsi, it's not a black and blue, it's not obviously a GMT. This is a timepiece that flies under the radar, and I can think of no greater compliment to a subdued, stealthy, and understated pilot's watch. Now, it's true the Barracuda deserved to be the last watch on this show, but then again, it's hard to beat a no-date sub. This is THE Rolex. If you were to save one from a fire in Geneva to be the basis for the entire future of the company, it would be the one most deeply rooted in company past, and that is the no-date sub. You can trace it back to the 6204s, 6205s, and 6200s of 1953 and 1954, the earliest rotating bezel Rolex dive watches, and this timepiece, 300 meters water resistant, part of a series launched in 2012, is the heir to those original Submariners. There is no such thing as a Submariner no date. There are Submariners and Submariner dates. This is the former. A watch technically 114060. It is a beloved model that is colloquially known as the no date. Graceful on the wrist, technically identical to the date. 
the 116610. The watch has an imposing stance, and it doesn't matter how big your wrist is. Our own Jason Main, who's a regular lumberjack with a wrist to match, wears the Note 8. 40 millimeters in steel, it's all you need. It does have the wrist presence of a 42, no doubt, and accurate as a chronometer, you're not giving up anything in terms of precision, nor are you giving up anything in terms of refinement, as you have the same glide lock class that you find on the Submariner Date. 20 millimeters of incremental adjustment in two millimeter increments, and you can see that those two millimeter increments allow you to adjust to 10 different spots. So pull it out all the way over a dive suit or make sizing adjustments as necessary for hot, cold activity or inactivity. It can also be used for sizing. So it is a very versatile mechanism. 20 millimeters of all out adjustment. A very special watch and a handsome one. I've got to say that if I'm going to flub the ending of the show and accidentally go out on the Barracuda, the bounce back and the recovery with the Note 8 sub ain't half bad. If you are a traditionalist and a dyed-in-the-wool dive watch connoisseur, if you want the ultimate in modern divers with respect for tradition, high horology finish, and a nod towards the future, endless continuity, and styling that defies planned obsolescence, pick one of these two beauties. You won't regret it. Thanks so much. I got Andrew on the camera. I got Harrison on the switcher today. I always appreciate the work of my crew. And thanks to you, I have the best job in the world. Stay well, be well, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.